Um, a very warm welcome to you again today. I just want to say thank you for joining us again, looking at this wonderful, wonderful study of the scripture. Uh, we're looking at the life of a man who we can say godly and deeply loves the Lord. I mean, for those of you who are wondering, as though you've been looking at men all this while, I just want to let you know that next year in January, we will be looking at the life of a wonderful woman, a, a great grandma, great, great grandma of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We'll be focusing on that next year on the, in our Sunday classes. But I want to bring to you that God tells us that even when it seems that every hope, our earthly hope is lost, He, God, can sustain us. And we're looking at the life of a man, Job, who responded very positively to the question, why am I serving God? Last week, you saw him answering this question in the form of who owns what I have. And Job sets the record straight, answering through his actions that everything that I have belonged to God. By acting right, Job demonstrates that the experience of loss may be painful. And the writer, by the inspiration of God, actually gave us that very clear picture. But he says that it could be very meaningful and it could shape our faith. Job responded very positively, demonstrating that when we leave, our lives from the perspective of our eternal significance, we can be sustained in times of suffering. Now, as we learn from Job, we have the assurance that we can continue to worship even when the things that we sometimes use to define ourselves and even what the world commonly used to define us are taken away even from our lives when our job is gone. When it seems our investments are gone, we can continue to worship the Lord. Job's life tells us that we are more than what we have or what we don't have. As we get into chapter 2 today, we think that that was all over. But Job is going to face a tougher temptation. He must answer the question again, why am I worshiping God? But this time around, he has to answer that question with his own life. When my hope is lost, including the hope of living, will I continue to trust God and worship? That's the question that Job must answer even right now. Now, let's look at Job chapter 2, beginning from verse 1. He said, again, there was a day, that there's another day, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. What I want you to pay attention to here is this. He said there is another day. This is not a repeat of what happened in chapter 1. This is another day. And I just want you to figure out this. Even in the place of worship, in the presence of God, the enemy is raising a question attacking the motive of why you worship the Lord. But may I point your attention quickly here before I move on? I want you to really understand how much God values the choice the capacity for choice that God gave to us. God values our choices so tremendously. The story here tells us many things, but there is one thing that stands out. 
that God will go to a great length to allow anything that will help us to get to the bottom of the motivation behind our choices. Satan is here saying, Job does not love you, God. He is just worshipping you because of what he receives from you. And God comes in the defense of Job saying, Job truly chooses to love me. And then Satan says, why don't you allow me to touch his life and see how he will respond. Now Job will have to prove his love for his God even with his life. The next scene tells us that Job must have lived in the pain of his loss for some time now. The loss of his children, the loss of his belongings. So it was not just a day and the second day things are happening. Job had been in this pain for quite a while and you would think that was the end of the whole thing. But there is another text. This was a period of silence from God, and I don't know how many of us going through this kind of experience. This is the kind of time that we will call the dark night of the soul, when it seems that God is not there any longer. Look at Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 to 47. Jesus experienced a similar thing. He said, now from the sixth hour until the night hour, there was darkness over all the land. That was when Jesus Christ was on the cross. And about the night hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that he is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There could come a time in the life of a child of God that it will seem as if God is not there. Why does God allow us to be tempted? Why do we need to go through this period of suffering and pain? God does that to prove the affection of our hearts, to unveil to us where we put our hope, hope and trust, to prove that we truly love him. If you and I are true to our claim that we belong to God, that we love God because God first loves us, we will give God all our belongings, even to the point of our life. Because God gave us his son and because he first loves us. God values our creation. We are created to make choices. And we must, through our choices, demonstrate that we are living for the reason we are created, namely to worship God. When God allows his children to be tested, God is allowing them to pass through a period of training which will strengthen them as much as it reveals the inner conditions of their hearts. The test of God is like the refiner's fire that purifies us. It doesn't destroy us, but it purifies us. What is the lesson here? First and foremost, God texts his own beloved children. That's what we are seeing here from verses 1 to 3. And Job is not the only one that has gone through this particular line of training. We see Abraham. And in the case of Abraham, God texted his love for him by asking him to offer his only child, the child that he has waited for for the rest of his life. And when he passed that test, I want you to hear the response of God. Genesis chapter 22 in verse 12. And God said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham was willing to give one child, and God promised that I will return back to you with children that are like the multitude of the stars in the heavenlies. Our God tests us because God wants to bless us. What about Jesus Christ? God allows Satan to test him in three important ways. Number one, he said, use your divine gifts for your self-seeking ambition, 
Number two, he said, use your divine gifts to pursue fame and popularity in the world. And number three, he said, abandon true worship. And worship me, Satan says. How did Jesus Christ respond? Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. He said, God is the only one that is worthy of worship. Get thee behind me, Satan. And look at what verse 11 says. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Temptation is God's training ground to develop his own beloved people. Look at what God says in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 9. I will bring the one third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. I will test them like gold, but I will purify them, God says. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 7. He said, in this you greatly rejoice. I believe you still remember that. He said, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. God tests his own beloved children. And I don't know what your test may be now. I don't know what you are going through. But there is one thing here the scripture is saying, that God is proving the motivation of your heart. And it's because God is really planning to bring the best out of you. As some of us, we run away when we go through trials and true tests. But there is one thing you will notice about this man, Job, as we get into a clearer, Part of his life, he ran to the Lord. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has will he give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely cause you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a pot shed with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Cast God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Maybe I need to point to you, brothers and sisters. You see, some people actually, they said this whole thing about faith, and they want it so easy and so in their own ways, they don't want to carry the cross. That is not the calling. If you look at it, even in the Old Testament, and as much as we can hear from Jesus Christ, our calling is deep, and sometimes it can be really painful and hard. Jesus Christ said, it is meant for only those who will carry their cross and they will follow. Now, here is what we are taking away from this man again. He is going to face death, but will his hope of eternal life carry him through? Satan said, Lord, skin for skin, all that a man has will he give for his life. Let me phrase this to you in a way that will be clearer. He said, a person 
if he or she has to offer someone else's life for his or her own life, will do so. When he has no choice, when she has no choice, but you can only know the motive of the person if the person is faced with a choice of offering his or her own life. Satan is telling God and say, you can tell the truth of Job's devotion because he's lost his children, he's lost his devotion. But the only time you will be able to test his, let him also offer his life for it. He afflicted Job with his skin disease. Job was struck with a rare skin disease that scientists today try to understand and they call it hyperimmunoglobulin E syndrome. I believe that, that that will be pronounced better by the experts. But this is exp expected, it is um, explained to be something like a repeated bacteria infection, infections of the skin and lungs. And this temptation will have appeared, and actually it is a life-threatening kind of condition, particularly in a time when medical knowledge has no, not really been expanded to what we know today. It was as if everything was over. This became so much overwhelming for Job, and this time around, a man faces his own trial and the test of faith with his own life. As if that was not enough, Job's wife came into this creature. It, it, it came into the story, asking Job, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Should she have stopped here, this would have been a probing question. For example, this would have been a wise question in an age where people generally believe that sickness is caused by God's anger on an individual, that somebody is sick because of sin. That was the general belief of the time. The wisdom here could have been to Job to search his heart and probably repent. Maybe the Lord is going to have mercy on him. But you may ask, is it right to pray the prayer of repentance and forgiveness even when we are sure that we have not sinned? Because Job was very clear and sure that he had not committed the sin of disobedience or had faulted before the Lord. But may I answer this question telling you it is absolutely right. Remember that Job himself offered sacrifice on behalf of his children, even when he was not sure that they had sinned against the Lord. So if his wife was calling him into that altar of prayer and the searching of his heart, that would have been a wonderful wisdom. Let's borrow some wisdom from the scripture. Psalm 139 verses 23 to 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. We've got blind spots. There are times that we do not even see the place where we have wronged others. That's the reason why it is important for us to ask the Lord to search us. And look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 17 verse 10. He said, so likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. This is a way of saying we don't really prove we are very holy, the more righteous, the most righteous, the most acclaimed individual. Rather, we come in that position of humility. Now, may I address some who will always see women as the problem here? Because we are good men to say, here we go again. Always women. I want you to remember that the Bible records more instances of men's disobedience than women's disobedience in the scripture. So rather than pointing finger to a particular sex, it is wiser to understand that the point lies in the fallenness of our human nature. Both sexes are prone to sin and prone to disobedience. Now, what is the problem with Job's wife? The problem was that she said, curse God and die. 
This is a seeming conclusion that God is unfair to Job that Job might as well give up her hope and her faith and die, just like anyone who says there is no God. Job's response actually teaches us and is a form of rebuke in the strongest term of such conclusion. Here you see a teasing, the belief that there is no God is rebuked in the language of the psalmist. Psalm 14, verse 1, he said, The fool had said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. Whether Job will continue to abide by his word will later be seen in the next chapters. Now we see the silent Job, the one who is rightly beside and fastly holding to his faith, but later we will see the complaining Job. And I want you to pay attention to something here. We must be careful of the seeds that are planted in our hearts, lest they begin to grow unknowingly and they lead us astray from the right path. The wife had said, cause God and die. Job's, a Job had refused, but we will eventually see what happens. There is one important thing that I must mention here before we move on from Job's wife into the next um, uh, 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 thing. She continues to abide with Job throughout his affliction. And arguably, as some will deny, she was the one who had 10 children for Job at the end of the whole suffering. And God never condemns her in the entire book. So we need to pay attention to that. Here we have the frustration of a woman or the frustration of a man, and they said something. We've got to be careful that we really put the whole thing within the, uh, the, the compassionate um, understanding of the scripture. Now, Job's response says, shall will indeed accept good from God, and shall will not accept adversity. The Bible says in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. That's the conclusion of the scripture here. Does Job sin with his heart? The conclusion of the scripture is no. Job exhibited the character of any suffering saint. But the scripture concludes that his heart is in the right place. This is the point. God knows our hearts when we suffer. And there are some times that both our feelings and emotions will betray what we believe to be right sometimes. But again, God knows us so deep. But God allows us to remain within that very I mean, uh, um, experience of our suffering. And many of us actually responded in different ways. Suffering is not easy. Pain. Is really hard and most of us are going through the experience of one loss or the other is very hard and a difficult place to be but the hope of our eternal life and the understanding of God's love that is very deep even to the point that he will give everything including his own life for us can carry us through when we suffer look at Job 42 verse 7 and so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Elias and Temanite, uh, the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. God says Job spoke the right thing. And we will see eventually many things that Job said. And I tell you, some people don't even want to get into this scripture. Because Job said a lot of things, even against God. As we move on, I want you to look at verses 11 to 13. Now we are looking at the friends of Job. When Job's three friends heard of all his adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Elivas, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Sophar, the Namatite. 
For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Now, can I point you to the power of mourning during suffering? And I want us to take all the good things away from this, because it is very helpful for us, even both for ourselves and for our friends and family. It is good to grieve with a friend, to mourn with a friend. So they came from a far away places, and they came when they heard of the misfortune of Job. Mourning with others is a great way to share in their suffering. It is commonly done in the, in the tradition that we are studying in those days for the dead. And uh, there are cases, however, when people will mourn for the living. So the case of Job is an example. And uh, David mourned for Absalom. He mourned for the nation of Israel when Saul was killed, uh, when the nation was defeated. So we could even mourn for the loss of something that is dear to our hearts. Mourning or grieving in the Jewish tra uh, tradition is done with the hope of helping the victim to process his or her grief and be healed in the hope of his eternal or her eternal life and the power of God to restore what has been taken away from them. This tradition is the faith tradition, believing that we have a transition into the eternal part of our life. Excessive mourning is discouraged because it questions our hope. And having said this, I want us to note that different people will have different journeys in their mourning experiences, and it will, it will take different people different timing in our mourning. Mourning our loved ones is a very, very important process. It is encouraged in the scripture, and it is very important for our healing. When we mourn, we are engaging in a great practice that will help us to say goodbye and release the beloved into the hand of God. Mourning prepares us to face the next right direction after our loss. Mourning gives us a healthy space in our hearts to face life and subsequent losses. We live in a world that is broken. So we're going to experience some more. When we mourn, we are ready by the grace of God and by the power of God to face the next morning. Mourning builds us and prepares us to help others who will experience a similar fate. Can I tell you something, brothers and sisters? Many young people today don't want to mourn. In fact, some of us don't have the time because of work commitment. We really want to move on very quickly and forget about what has happened. That is not healthy. Mourning helps us to grow healthy and it prepares our heart to be in the right place. Look at these friends. They wept with Job. This is a compassionate response to the suffering of a friend, a brother. It symbolizes the believer's act of coming alongside one another, either during grief or happiness. Jesus wept in John chapter 11 verses 35 to 36. And look at how the scripture puts it beautifully. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Weeping unveils the tenderness of our hearts. Weeping unveils compassion in the heart. And weeping unveils sorrow in the heart. And it, sometimes it could unveil the joy in our hearts too. But I want you to realize this. When we experience the coming alongside by our friends and fellow believers, we know that we are not alone. But not only that, we also know that God is there with us when we suffer. 
In Psalm chapter 51, verse 17, the Bible tells us the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Brokenness of the heart, God doesn't take away his eyes from them. People mourn in different ways. So not everyone will respond in the same way. And I tell you, there are differences in cultural expressions too. We need to be very careful even as we discern how our friends are mourning. Now, can I point your attention to this before we end? And I want you to judge this yourself. You won't be able to answer that question now, but eventually with time as we live deeper, you may be able to answer the question. Do Job's friend came to empathize with him or they came to sympathize with him? Look at the way the scripture puts it. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. In the most practical way, this is identifying themselves with Job's situation. It is a symbolism that suggests humility. These actions depict their affirmation that they are made from the dust of the earth, and it also signifies acts of repentance and a cry for mercy. But whether eventually it's going to be a kind of pointing fingers, we're going to see. They symbolize identification with Job, they are calling for repentance and they are crying for mercy. What eventually is this going to become? We will be able to answer that question later. But Psalm 103 verses 13 to 14 says, As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are dust. So their action here is a symbolism of their understanding that they are frail and they are weak and they are calling upon God for mercy. What is the distinction between empathy and sympathy? Empathy gives compassion and understanding in genuine ways that impact others positively. Empathy gives a positive response to the hurting individual at the different stages of his or her heart. Empathy does not run ahead of the hurting person. Rather, they stand side by side. What about sympathy? It is an expression of a feeling of pity. Sometimes it is even a suggestion of saying, God, I thank you that that does not happen to me. These friends remained silent. They were too disturbed by Job's health condition that they spoke no single word. Oh, that is golden. If that was the only thing they did, maybe that would have been fantastic. It would have been wisdom on their own side to remain silent when they do not understand the whole story. The worst thing we can do is pretend that we know why someone else is going through suffering and we judge them. When we do that, sometimes we can put ourselves in the position of God. Brothers and sisters, there is a lot of suffering in our world today. And there are many people who are going through it right now. There is no small suffering. There is no big suffering. It affects different people in different ways. And this is why I want you to look into the questions that we had this week. And let's talk about some of these things that we are looking at. The main question is this, why are we worshiping God? If our possessions are taken away, are we going to continue to worship the Lord? What about when our lives are right in the stake? Are we going to continue to worship the Lord? And how can we help someone who is going through even a difficult time now, I want us to end by praying, and I ask you to please close your eyes and bow your head with me. Heavenly Father, we so thank you. One way or the other, we must show whether you are the prior and the most important God in our lives. We worship because you love us. I pray for those who are going through 
experiences of suffering. And I pray for those who are asking questions. Why am I going through this? And I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters who are going to go alongside those who are going through really hard time. Lord, I pray for your wisdom. I pray for your grace. Lord, I believe that that hope that you have given unto us deeply within can hold us ahead and can prepare us even in time like this. I pray, O oh God, that you will give us your strength, that the hope of our eternal life will be clearer and you will lead us. Bless us in our discussion sessions and may you reach out to this heart, that one individual or that family, that little child or that elderly person whose heart is raising the question, where are you, God? in my life and in my situation. I pray for those who are suffering because they want deliverance from some addiction. I pray that you will help them. I pray for those who have lost their loved ones and those who are suffering because they need a job. I pray you will reach out to them. And I'm asking, Father, that you will bless us even as we continue in our discussion sessions. Thank you because I believe you've heard our prayers. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. I will see you again on Sunday. Thank you.